I got on the binoculars, I seen that it was not an aircraft. I immediately go to my camcorder just like that, and I started recording. For two valley men, Mike Forston on the east side, John Edmonds in the west, the Phoenix lights aren't something safe in the past. This is video Forston took from the backyard of his home just three months ago. Higher and faster than a jetliner? Oh yeah, no contrail. Slowing and freezing the picture on his home computer shows a distinct triangle-shaped craft. And you can still see right, right here mm -hmm. that it maintains that kind of V shape. Yeah. Forston insists what he shot is nothing like a regular airplane. Here comes one coming in down here from the east, and if I were to videotape this, I could probably get three or four minutes of video on this thing. And he feels sure his object is not this, one of the Air Force stealth bomber. And that would come in, they would stop, they would pause, and then afterwards they would break off and they would just disperse. Like Forston, John Edmonds is one of perhaps thousands of people who saw lights and triangles in the sky above Arizona March 13, 1997. But since that night, he's had closer looks. John Edmonds didn't need a video camera to get a better look at the triangular object he saw. For him, it was already too close. Is that That's more? pretty close. That's now, pretty close. And then show Shaped like this, dark and metallic, hovering. And it was like right there. And hovering? And hovering like about 50 or 60 feet off the ground. His closest look would come in May of 1998. He hasn't spoken publicly about it until now. I was scared. I mean, look around. There's no place to run. <laughs> you know, there's nothing you can do if you if something happened to you out here. Nobody finds you. Searching for a lost dog on this land near his home, he finds something hard to explain. That tree right there. Then imagine the other tip of the craft, 20 to 30 feet beyond this little tree over here. And then imagine it being about two stories high and imagine it floating about 50 feet off the ground and absolutely silent. Edmund's instinct is to run home to get the video camera. I turned the, uh, to go back to the Jeep and the next thing I knew, it was an hour and five minutes later. The video camera was hanging from my shoulder. It was turned on. It was facing the ground. There was nothing on the tape. And it was an hour and five minutes later, and I didn't have a clue what happened. You can't account for that hour and five minutes. No. Edmund's account closely matches the shape and size of this, a graphic rendering of the object so many Arizonans say they saw March 13, 1997. On the ground around that spot, animal skeletons, skins, but no heads or skulls. Edmund says since his sighting, nothing's grown on this ground until this spring. For these two valley men and many, many others, that March night four years ago is not the end, but the beginning of the story. Steve Filmer, Fox 10 News. It may be the most exciting, but least understood force of nature. Get ready, get ready. Stop. Scientists launch expensive instruments on balloons. Even rockets with copper wires to bring down and better understand bolts of lightning. So, how much can something the size of a pager really tell you about lightning? I got another hit. The business end of the strike alert lightning detector is the row of lights, each one lights up to show distances, when bolts hit between 40 miles right down to right on top of you. We go up high, over 6,000 feet, at the Grand Canyon Airport for our first test drive. Strike alert seems to be keeping pace with every flash and boom. The range lights seem in line with what we're hearing and seeing. Here's a tougher test. We're at the ASU Climate Center, ground zero for the school's storm chaser team. Strike alert's second promise is to show you whether a lightning storm is moving toward you or away. Lights left to right, the storm is coming in. Lights blinking right to left, it's going away. Again, strike alert matches the action, right down to the movements of this sudden microburst. The zero to six mile warning light is a bit silly. Once the lightning's this close, you're seeing and hearing it. 
But we say fame, not shame for strike alert. And just bear in mind, though it may help keep you from getting struck, it won't necessarily keep you from getting soaked. Steve Filmer, Fox 10 News. See this shape in the air and you may swear it's, well, alien. But trust me, this is not a UFO. Right now, it's mostly mock-up. Clicks on keyboards connect to flips on flaps that will all come together to fly the plane. The project is called Pegasus. That's an aluminum engine mount, a handful of steel nuts and bolts. In total, there's probably only seven or eight pounds of metal on this entire plane. Most of the rest is carbon fiber. Some parts so hush-hush, we aren't allowed to show you much of what's going on in inside this aircraft. One thing that will never go inside, a pilot. Will allow us to take the pilot out of the more dangerous roles and out of the more dull roles. No bailing out of burning cockpits. See, that's what it's going to feel like when you're under G's. No passing out from G-forces. Next thing you know, you're going to be under a parachute. No punching out or parachutes. This camera will be the plane's eye. Built-in microphones will be the ears. It's that last sanity check uh, before we get ready to land to make sure that we're landing in the right place where we think we're landing. This will not be some mindless, overgrown, radio-controlled plane. We want the airplane to look, smell, and feel like a manned airplane so that the people that are working with it will think of it as no different than as any other airplane that they have been working with for years. There is just one um, catch. Engineers have no doubt the final plane will be able to drop these successfully. First, the plane has got to prove it can drop one of these. This is the hook that drops out of the tail of the plane that catches the cable on the aircraft carrier and lets the plane come to a stop. Yeah, like that. With the help of global positioning satellites, Pegasus will go where it's told, hit targets, duck the bad guys. There will always be a man in the loop. Instead of being in the cockpit of the airplane itself, he will be back on board the ship, and he will make the final decision on whether to release the weapons or not. And the day may be coming when those Top Gun Navy pilots spend more time floating around on the ship, while planes like Pegasus do the flying and the fighting. Steve Filmer, Fox 10 News.